It was a racially motivated crime. It was a racially motivated murder. They got exactly what they deserved. Had to do it over again. I killed more. I thought they were Jews. I thought they were Jews. I would not have shot them otherwise. And to Mr. Jeremy Christian, your mom should have swallowed. I should have killed you. I should have killed you. I'll hit you. This is Peyton Gendron, a mass murder suspect in New York. According to reports, on May 14, 2022, Gendron carried out a mass shooting at a Topps Friendly Market supermarket on the east side of Buffalo. It started around 2.30 Saturday afternoon in the parking lot of this Topps Friendly Market store in a predominantly black neighborhood in Buffalo. He live-streamed part of the attack on Twitch, a video streaming platform. First, Gendron was seen getting into some tactical gear. Upon reaching his destination, Gendron can be heard saying, just gotta go for it. And this is the end. Just gotta go for it, man. It's the end, right here. What happened next left the whole world shocked. The shooter opening fire as soon as he got out of his car, striking four people in the parking lot, killing three. Then storming the store, shooting nine more people inside. Police say it all happened in a matter of minutes, starting around 2.30 Saturday afternoon. The shooter fired about 50 shots. All 10 victims killed were black. Contact homicide. We have bodies down here. Twitch shut down the live stream within minutes, but the damage was already done. The world had glimpsed the horror unfolding in real time. Police arrived immediately, but by that time, 10 people had already lost their lives, and a further three were injured. All the victims were African Americans. Dispatch calls captured the horrors that unfolded that day. Six, if you're en route there, we got an update. Possible active shooter at the top. There are still shots being fired. We got at least three people down on the ground. I can't tell you about shooting. This might be an individual with body armor. Cornered, looks like three people face down at least. We have bodies down here. Yo, also, we're going to need some officers inside the top because we have numerous bodies and we have uh, magazines and uh, bullets and everything, so we need uh, evidence to show. Gendron was soon arrested. He shot a lot of people up in there. Oh my God. Yeah, he shot a lot of people in there. Oh my God. Wow. He a terrorist or something. Yo, he gotta be a terrorist. This, oh my god, he shot so many people in there. Wow. Yo. Oh. Wow. Wow. Yep. Authorities said he initially tried to kill himself. Bud was talked out of it by officers. He worked his way back towards the front of the store. Buffalo police immediately respond, engage the suspect in the uh, vestibule of the store. And at that point, the suspect put the gun to his own neck. Buffalo police personnel, two patrol officers, uh, talked the suspect into dropping the gun. He dropped the gun, took off some of his tactical gear, surrendered at that point. They also called it an act of terrorism. To see that sense of security shattered, by an individual, a white supremacist who has engaged in an act of terrorism and will be prosecuted as such. At his trial, the prosecution argued that Gendron had tried to start a race war. On May 14th of 2022, this defendant displayed a callous disregard for human life. He drove over 200 miles out of his way with one mission, with one goal, to kill as many black people as possible. During that three hour drive, he could have turned around but he wouldn't be deterred. He was steadfast to accomplish his goal of killing as many black people as possible and starting a race war. They also said he targeted the area which is predominantly a black neighborhood. Gendron had also canvassed and made drawings of the supermarket area prior to his attack. Two days before the attack, Gendron also posted online a 180 page manifesto that described his motives and showed his support for white supremacism. The assault rifle Gendron used to carry out the attack was also littered with racist words and names of individuals who had previously carried out similar attacks. Eventually, Gendron pleaded guilty to all charges related to murder, domestic terrorism, and hate crimes. At his sentencing, emotionally charged family members of the victims directly addressed their loved one's killer. 
You will be shut away from the world. You will not enjoy family events. You will not enjoy outings with friends. You will be nameless and faceless, and we feel sorry for you. We pity you even. Your life was meaningless before May 14th, 2022, and you woke up every day feeling small. And trust me and believe, these dudes can't stop me, really. I'm the littlest thing in here and very agile, but I don't want to hurt you. However, one family member tried to take matters into his own hands. You don't like black people, man. You don't know a damn thing about black people. We're human. We like our kids to go to good schools. We love our kids. We never go in no neighborhoods and take people out. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. He charged at Gendron, but was quickly detained and escorted out of the courtroom. Gendron, too, was given a chance to address the court, where he showed remorse for his actions and apologized to the victim's families. I'm very sorry for stealing the lives of your loved ones. I cannot express how much I regret all the decisions I made leading up to my actions on May 14th. I did a terrible thing that day. I shot and killed people because they were black. Looking back now, I can't believe I actually did it. I believed what I read online and acted out of hate. And now I can't take it back, but I wish I could. And I don't want anyone to be inspired by me and what I did. The judge also had some harsh words for Gendron. There is no place for you or your ignorant, hateful, and evil ideologies in a civilized society. There can be no mercy for you, no understanding, no second chances. The damage you have caused is too great, and the people you have hurt are too valuable to this community. You will never see the light of day as a free man ever again. Ultimately, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. It is the judgment of this court that you be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. As you can imagine, a racially motivated crime like the one Peyton committed is certain to get you life in prison. However, this wasn't the only time a racist got what they deserved. Take, for example, the nasty case of Benton Byer, stalking and harassing an interracial couple in Cold Spring, Minnesota. According to reports, Byer crashed a stolen SUV into the family home of Andrea and Philippe Robinson. Police said Byer had placed a large piece of granite slab on the gas pedal and directed it to crash into the Robinsons' home. The whole incident was captured on a ring camera. Inside the truck, a teddy bear hung from a noose, symbolizing the racist intent behind the attack. The event left the Robinsons in shock. I'm still in shock. I, I can't believe this. Every day I just come out here and think it's a, <clears throat> it's a bad dream. How do I, I supposed to feel safe? I mean, my wife, my children don't want to stay here, and I understand. However, this was not their first encounter with Bayer. It all started when the Robinsons posted a video about racism and put a Black Lives Matter sign in their yard. In retaliation, Bayer had smashed in the windows of Andrea and her daughter's cars. I tell the world what my kids go through. Wake up to her. The car window is busted out. And here we go again. Our windows are broken again. The sunroof is shattered. This led to a restraining order being filed against Bayer. However, that did not deter him, as the harassment lasted over 80 days. He went from busting out windows, to shooting at cameras, to knowing our schedule well enough that he would follow my wife at grocery stores. Andrea even made a play on social media about their whole ordeal. He's very well aware of our schedule because he stalks us every day for the past 83 days. I need everyone watching this video to contact the Stearns County Prosecutor's Office, to contact every media organization because we will be willing to speak. Finally, Bayer was arrested after a neighbor turned him in. He was charged with stalking, harassment, first-degree property damage, and second-degree assault. 
Court documents revealed that Byer's racial attack started because he believed his girlfriend cheated on him with Philippe's son. Eventually, the jury found Byer guilty of seven charges, including two counts of second-degree assault. At his sentencing, an emotional Andrea recounted how Byer's actions had damaged her home and family. Nothing could be worse than the impact your actions have had on my life and the life of my family. You did not destroy a home. You, you destroyed a family. Every day I'm faced with the same struggle. The house I once called home <laughs> now resembles the shell of a life that once was and a family that's forever changed. The place we once called home will, will be emptied of its contents and sold. Buyer too addressed the court showing remorse for his actions and asking the Robinsons for forgiveness. They affected the Robinson family and home. And for that, I'm sorry. I hope they forgive me and go on living their lives peacefully. Ultimately, Bayer was sentenced to 105 months in prison, where he had to serve at least 70 months before being eligible for parole. While Benton Bayer will spend close to nine years in prison for his relentless racial attacks, how does it compare to killing multiple people at a religious gathering? Like in the case of 28-year-old Brenton Tarrant, a mass murder suspect in New Zealand. According to reports, on March 15, 2019, Tarrant carried out a meticulously planned attack on two mosques in Christ Church during the Friday evening prayers. Wearing a helmet-mounted camera, he live-streamed part of the attack on Facebook as he was seen driving towards the Al Nur Mosque. Upon reaching his target area, Tarrant heavily armed himself and nonchalantly walked towards the mosque as passers-by looked on in shock. As soon as he reached the entrance, Tarrant opened fire. A gunman wearing all black, clad in a helmet and a bulletproof vest, entered the Al Noor Mosque in the city of Christchurch. He then ruthlessly opened fire during a packed Friday prayer service, killing at least 41 men, women, and children in the first mosque. In just two minutes, Tarrant fired 144 times. He then drove to the Linwood Islamic Center, laughing, commentating, and shooting at will. Seven more people would die there. Tarrant wasn't finished there. After the Al Noor Mosque, he drove to the Linwood Islamic Center, laughing and commentating as he went. Seven more people would die there. Tarrant was planning to go on to another mosque when his car was rammed by police and he was arrested. In total, 51 people lost their lives and 40 others were injured. The victims were mostly from Islamic backgrounds. At his trial, the prosecution argued that Tarrant's goal was to wipe out non-European immigrants. And he intended to instill fear into those he described as invaders, including the Muslim population or more generally non-European immigrants. Eventually, Tarrant pleaded guilty to all charges of murder, attempted murder and terrorism. To each of these charges, charge 1 to 51, how do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? Yes, guilty. At his sentencing, emotionally charged family members of the victims directly addressed their loved one's killer. He is a loner, a big fat loser, a coward and a pathetic human being. Your father was a garbage man and you became trash of society. He is ashamed of your identity. You deserve to be buried in a landfill. I'm strong. And you made me even stronger. In a historic ruling, Tarrant was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, the first time such a sentence was handed down in New Zealand. On each of the 51 charges of murder, charges 1 to 51, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. I order that you serve the sentences without parole. While Brenton Tarrant got life in prison for his hate crimes, what happens when you kill someone by taking the law into your own hands? Like in the case of Travis McMichael, who was accused of murdering a black man in Georgia. Reports suggest that Travis fatally shot and killed 25-year-old Ahmaud Arbery in an alleged racially motivated hate crime. CCTV footage from the same day showed Arbery entering an under-construction house, number 220, on Satilla Drive in Brunswick. A neighbor called 911, saying Arbery resembled a recent trespasser in the area. There's a guy in the house right now, the house under construction, 219 or 220, 
still a driver. And he's been caught on the camera a bunch before at night. It's kind of an ongoing thing out here. Black guy, white guy. On multiple occasions before, several trespassers were caught trespassing at 220 Satilla. Hence, neighbors were aware and the community was on alert. Minutes after entering the property, Arbery was seen dashing out. He's running right now. There he goes right now. Okay, what is he doing? Running down the street. Neighbors Travis and his father Gregory McMichael from 230 Satilla were then seen grabbing their guns and getting into a truck to pursue Arbery. Another neighbor, William Bryan, also joined the pursuit. Police soon received a 911 call from Gregory, saying they were chasing a black male, but the call got disconnected after a commotion. 911, what's the address of emergency? Uh, I'm not here. Tell the stores. There's a black male running down the street. Satilla, where, where, where at Satilla Shores? I don't know what street we're on. Stop right there. Stop. Grab it. Sir, hello. Sir, sir, where are you at? Hello. When police arrived at the scene, Arbery was seen lying in a pool of blood, while Gregory tried to comfort his son, Travis. 136, go ahead and start this way, please. All three suspects gave statements to the police. Gregory said they were trying to make a citizen's arrest of Arbery. We see him come around the corner. He's going down here. We pull up beside him. Hey, stop, stop. We want to talk to you. And he just keeps on running. So the guy, I mean, he's looking dead at us. You know, I mean, he's like, me to you. And he turns and he runs. Travis gets out with the shotgun and runs up there. And, you know, I said, Travis, don't, don't shoot, don't do anything. Then Brian said he helped block Arbery from getting away multiple times. I pulled out of my driveway, was going to try to block him. But he was going all around it, and I made a few moves at him, you know, um, and he, he didn't stop. And finally, Travis, who had pulled the trigger, said he shot Arbery in self-defense. That was outside, saw him running, running by, and the neighbors pointing and everything. So saw who running by? Him. Okay. So we run out to stop him to talk to him. Mm -hmm. He took well, off running. He came over here. Stop. Stopped. He came out of the truck running at us. I told him stop, stop, stop till he hit me. I had nothing to do. I could There's nothing else I can do. No arrests were made for days until a leaked video surfaced online. It was a cell phone video made by Brian around the same time Gregory had called 911. What followed next was utter chaos. In the video, Arbery is seen fleeing from his pursuers, but Travis and Gregory's truck intercepted him. A scuffle followed, which ended up with Arbery getting shot by Travis and slumping to the ground. Both Travis and Gregory were arrested for the murder of Ahmad Arbery. Brian, too, was arrested soon after. All three were charged with felony murder, aggravated assault, and false imprisonment. In court, Travis testified that his initial intention was to monitor Arbery's movements. Wasn't it your intention to go around the block and cut him off and find him over on the other side? To uh, head him off and to see where he's located. That was my intention, yes ma'am. Right. But you could have stopped right there and not done anything, right? Yes, but then immediately after is when I saw his interaction with the black truck mm -hmm. and realized that there is something to my suspicions here and I would like to see where he is at when the cops come, which I assume that the police were on the way, that I would be able to tell them where he's at if they haven't located him at that point. He then claimed that Arbery got into a scuffle with him, struck him and tried to take away his shotgun. By the time I get the front truck, he is at the front corner panel on the right hand side and he turns and is on me and it's on me. I mean, in a flash. I mean, it's immediately on me. On you doing what? He grabs the shotgun, and I believe I was struck. So he shot Arbery in self-defense. What did you do? I shot. Why? He he had my gun. He he struck me. It was obvious that he was. Uh, it was obvious that that he was attacking me. That if he would have got the shotgun from me, then it was a this is a life or death situation. But the investigator in the case testified that it was in fact Arbery who acted out in self-defense when his attempts to escape the trio failed. I believe Mr. Arbery's decision was to just try to get away. When he felt like he could not escape, he chose to fight. This was backed up by prosecutor Linda Dunikoski, who argued the events that unfolded that day did not qualify to make a citizen's arrest. Other people can't go up and stop us. 
and hold us and detain us, okay? They have to actually have seen us commit that crime in order to effectuate a citizen's arrest. In fact, the trio had no authority to detain an innocent man. Did not have no badge, no uniform, no authority. Just some strange guys in a white pickup truck. Strangers. Linda then argued that everything the trio did that day was based on assumptions, as there was no evidence that Arbery had actually committed a crime. This is what I was thinking. Mr. Arbery may have run by. Maybe Matt had seen him. Maybe he has broken in. Maybe Larry English is over at 220. I don't know. Maybe Ahmaud Arbery was caught. Maybe Ahmaud Arbery is running from the police. This was backed up by the investigator who said Gregory had previously testified to police that they were chasing Arbery only based on a hunch. He makes admissions to seeing Mr. Arbery running down the roadway. Um, his statement to the effect is he didn't know Mr. Aubrey had stolen anything or not, but he had a gut feeling that Mr. Aubrey may have been responsible for thefts that were in the neighborhood. Linda then claimed the trio had drawn conclusions that day based on their racist mentality. But he assumed the worst. He must have committed some crime. What's your emergency? There's a black man running down the street. In fact, the investigation of the case had revealed that Travis was a well-known racist. He says, makes the comment, that would only be better if they'd have blown that effing N-words, or that blown that N-words head off. He made the statement that he loved his job because he was out on a boat and there weren't any N-words anywhere. Eventually, Travis, Gregory, and Brian were convicted of felony murder, aggravated assault, false imprisonment, and criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment. Travis was further convicted of malice murder. Ultimately, Travis and Gregory McMichael were sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Mr. McMichael, the court sentences you as follows. Count one, malice murder, life without the possibility of parole. Greg McMichael, the court sentences you as follows. Count one, malice murder, defendant was found not guilty. Count two, felony murder, life without the possibility of parole. While William Bryan was sent to life in prison with the possibility of parole. Court sentences Mr. Bryan to uh, life with the possibility of parole on count three. While taking the law into their own hands proved costly for the McMichaels and William Bryan, how does it compare to abusing the power of law? Like in the case of William Melendez, who's on trial for police brutality against a black man in Detroit. Reports suggest that on January 28, 2015, Detroit police officer William Melendez assaulted 57-year-old Floyd Dent during a patrol stop. Dashcam footage from a police vehicle showed Dent getting pulled over on Inkster Road, Michigan, for disregarding a stop sign. Melendez could be seen approaching the car with his gun aimed at Dent. His partner then pulled out an unarmed dent from the car and slammed him to the ground. Then Dent, who had already surrendered, was shockingly put in a chokehold by Melendez while his partner held him down. But what Melendez did next shocked the whole legal system. In a shocking act of brutality, Melendez started to unleash a barrage of punches to Dent's head. In total, Melendez punched Dent 16 times before choking him unconscious. Backup arrived and almost half a dozen police officers tried to handcuff a helpless Dent, whom Melendez had kept in a chokehold all this while. Finally, a bloodied and battered dent was restrained and taken away while officers started to search his car. Footage inside the police vehicle showed Dent tearing up from a swollen eye. Dent was also charged with possession of cocaine, which was later dropped. The focus shifted to Melendez, who was arrested and charged with misconduct and assault. At the trial, Dent took the stands and recalled his terrifying ordeal. The guy with the gun was on the, uh, by the end of the door, and another guy, uh, with a black shirt cap on, 
they came to the car and the guy with the gun told me, get out the car or I'll blow your... Say hey, what he said. He said, get out the car, I'll blow your head off. He also identified Melendez as the officer who attacked him. Do you have a memory of uh, that officer? Uh, who he had? What he looked like? Yes. Uh, would you recognize him if you saw him again? Yes. Would you point to him and describe him? Judge, we will stipulate to identification. There's no doubt who was out there that night. I was right there in the... Uh... They went on to say how Melendez brutalized him that night. And uh, what happened when you hit the ground? What was he doing to you when you hit the ground? When I hit the ground, he had jumped, jumped on me and grabbed me by the uh, throat. And you just go, go ahead. I'm sorry. And he started, he started choking me. Then he, he started beating me in the head. When asked about the impact of the assault. Dent said his ability to process information was disrupted after the attack. Um, do you have uh, problems uh, processing? Yes. Okay. And uh, did you have problems processing before these events? No. Meaning that I can't uh, remember things. Uh, uh, it takes me a while to catch up to think about what... Uh, Someone tell me or ask me. Eventually, Melendez was found guilty of all charges. How does the jury find the defendant, William Gail Melendez, as to count two, assault with intent to do great bodily harm less than murder, complainant Floyd Dent? Guilty. As to count three, misconduct in office? Guilty. At his sentencing, Melendez took the stand and apologized to Dent and his family. To Mr. Dent and his family, I am truly sorry if this has caused undue hardships in your personal life. And if you have any animosity towards law enforcement, that was not my intention. But the judge was having none of it, saying Melendez abused his authority as a police officer. You l utilize your dirty, hairy tactics and use excessive force to arrest him. You betrayed your city. You caused your lovely wife heartache. And you caused Mr. Dent severe anguish. Ultimately, Melendez was sentenced to 13 months to 10 years in prison for the assault on Floyd Dent. I'm going to commit you to the Michigan Department of Corrections as to count one for no less than 13 months, no more than 10 years. While William Melendez used excessive police power to assault a black man, how does it compare to going on a stabbing spree on a train? Like in the case of Jeremy Christian, who's on trial for murder and hate crime charges in Oregon. Reports suggest that on May 25th, 2017, Christian went on a hate-filled rant against Muslims, African Americans, and other groups on board the Max train in Portland. It's like we got a Christian or Muslim bus driver, I'll stab you too. When Demetria Hester, a black woman, protested, Christian followed her off the train and assaulted her. He's looking at me and telling me I'm about to get in now. What do you do? Walking. What's about to happen here? He throws the bottle to my eye. CCTV footage caught Christian throwing a bottle full of water at Hester, injuring her eye. Christian, who had been drinking and smoking marijuana all night, boarded the same train the next day. This time, two black teenagers in hijabs were the target of his racist slur, 16-year-old Destiny Mangum and 17-year-old Walia Muhammad. When other passengers intervened, Christian turned his aggression toward them. A bystander captured the whole incident. The situation got heated as the three men got into a scuffle. This is when things went horribly wrong.
Christian ended up fatally stabbing 53-year-old Army veteran Ricky Best and 23-year-old college student Talisan Namkai Meki, while seriously injuring 21-year-old poet Micah Fletcher, who later survived. Christian then stormed off the train, brandishing his bloody knife. Police soon arrived and arrested Christian, who went off on a sensational rant. He even threatened the authorities. Finally, a mask was put over Christian's head and he was taken to prison. You better deal with it. I die in prison and half a man. She's gonna give me back. Christian was charged with murder, attempted murder, and hate crime assault. At his trial, an emotional Walia Muhammad held back tears as she recounted the horrors she faced at the hands of Christian. <laughs> was there I didn't say kill yourself. He was saying Muslims. Saying go back to Saudi Arabia. Survivor Micah Fletcher also took the stand, testifying that Christian stabbed him in the neck after being confronted. Oh, he responded by stabbing me in the throat. Say it again? He responded by stabbing me in the throat. Eventually, the jury found Jeremy Christian guilty on all counts. At his sentencing, Demetria Hester had some choice words for Christian in her victim impact statement. This is when he exploded. And to Mr. Jeremy Christian, your mom should have swallowed you. You are a waste of breath. And when you die and go to hell, I hope you rot. See you there, bitch. <laughs> yeah, hey. Go back to Tennessee, too. No, what do I tell you? Go back to Tennessee, too. We don't want you here. All your race, baby. We ain't gonna be mayor either. We ain't gonna be mayor either. As he was being taken out of the courtroom, Christian threatened to kill the victim. Ultimately, Christian was sentenced to two life terms without the possibility of parole. While Jeremy Christian stabbed three men for protesting against him, what happens when you racially abuse a child celebrating his birthday? Yeah, we see you too, baby! We see you too, baby! See, that's a threat! That's a threat! Stop that child! That's a threat! Like in the case of Kayla Norton and Jose Torres, who are facing charges for racially abusing a group of African Americans in Georgia. Reports suggest that on July 2015, Norton and Torres, who were part of a group called Respect the Flag, were driving around Douglas County with dozens of other members displaying the Confederate battle flag on their pickup trucks. Their convoy stopped near a residence and disrupted the birthday party of an eight-year-old black child. This is a child's birthday party. Armed with guns and knives, the group allegedly hurled racial slurs and threatened to kill the guests. Look at this shit. We'll see y'all again. We'll see y'all again. We're gonna see y'all again. <laughs> at one point, Torres had even pointed a shotgun at the crowd and threatened to shoot. Terrorized family called 911. And we were having a party, and these white guys pulled out with rebel flags and stuff, holding shotguns on us and stuff. Okay. Please send 911. They got knives and guns. Knives they got knives. knives and guns. Yes. Yes. Clearly in distress, the woman pleaded with the operator to send help. What's your name, honey? Please send somebody. Please send somebody before somebody gets shot. Okay. Police arrived soon and formed a shield around the guests while the group eventually started leaving. I got it. 
Oh yeah, you too. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. A good day. Bye. Even the presence of the police did not seem to deter the offenders. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah, we see you too, baby. We see you too, baby. See, that's a threat. That's a threat. Stop that truck. That's a threat. That's a threat. Stop that truck. That's a threat. That's a threat. No, that's a threat. You stop that truck. That's a threat. Eventually, Kayla Norton and Jose Torres were arrested, found guilty of making terroristic threats and violating Georgia's Street Gang Terrorism and Prevention Act. Torres was additionally convicted of aggravated assault. At their sentencing, an emotional Norton showed remorse for her actions and apologized to the family. Then, in a completely unexpected turn of events, the victim directly addressed the duo and forgave them. I forgive you. You can't forgive all of you. I'm not a man spirit like this. I do. I forgive you. Ultimately, Norton was sentenced to six years in prison with nine years of probation. El Torres received 13 years in prison and seven years of probation. Additionally, they were both banished from Douglas County. While Kayla Norton and Jose Torres got lengthy prison sentences for their racist actions, how does it compare to hailing Hitler in court? Like in the case of 73-year-old Frazier Glenn Cross, a white supremacist accused of murdering three people in Kansas. I thought they were Jews. I thought they were Jews. I wouldn't have shot them otherwise. According to reports, on April 13, 2014, Cross fatally shot 69-year-old William Corcoran and his 14-year-old grandson, Reet Underwood, at the Jewish Community Center in Overland Park. Police say on Sunday, April 13th, Cross went to the Jewish Community Center and opened fire in the parking lot. 69-year-old William Corcoran was there with his grandson, Reet. Both were killed. A few blocks away, a former member of the Ku Klux Klan gunned down 53-year-old Terry Lamano outside the Village Shalom Retirement Center. A few blocks away, Terry Lamano was gunned down outside the Village Shalom Retirement Center. Police showed up quickly and took Cross into custody. One of the officers caught the whole thing on his body cam. One of them captured this dash cam video. Take a look. It shows Fraser Glenn Cross being arrested by Overland Park Police. You can see he's surrounded by several officers. They said Cross asked for a celebratory whiskey after the shootings. He was even heard screaming Nazi slogans out of the back of the police car. Cross fired his lawyers and represented himself in court. This led to a trial full of disruptions and outbursts. I spent 20 well, years in the Army, two children in Vietnam, let me tell you, three more. Stop. I earned the right off speech. Stop. Freedom of speech. Stop. At his pretrial hearing, Cross exploded at the judge before being thrown out of the courtroom. Well, you are a dumb for the Jews standing in them judgment. You are a dumb Don't take a break. At his trial, the prosecution claimed Cross was a proud and remorseless killer. To decide the fate of a man whom the evidence shows to be a proud and remorseless killer who regrets only that he did not kill more people. He also argued that Cross was a known racist, as some of his interviews back in 2006 suggested. The only thing I ain't figured out is whether to hate all you Jews are just a Zionist. And when the prosecution questioned him about his motives, Cross lost his cool again. So really, this is about you being infamous is why you did it. Nah, nah. Are you kidding? Are you kidding me? He was adamant that his crimes were racially motivated. Do you recall saying that the Jews will remember my name? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Cross argued that his intent was not criminal, but patriotic. The state must prove my criminal intent. I submit that I had no criminal intent. Attempt, intent. I had a patriotic intent to stop the genocide against my people. He believed his victims were Jews. Instead, they turned out to be Christians. I do apologize for those who died. And I did not, I thought they were Jews. I thought they were Jews. I wouldn't have shot them otherwise. 
Throughout his trial, Cross showed a lack of remorse, saying he felt free after the killings. For the first time in 48 years, I felt free, free, free. It was such a glorious feeling, I can't even describe it adequately. Then shockingly, Cross said that God knew the shootings were right and moral. If there is a God up there, God, you know that what I did and what's in my heart is righteous, is honorable, and moral. And therefore, God, you will reward me. But it was when the judge denied him permission to enter certain website articles as evidence, Cross erupted. I'll just get a hell out of here, go back to myself, and wait for phase two if you're not going to give me a fair trial. You want him to answer a simple question? What the hell am I with you, Miller? The judge gave him a warning, but Cross was having none of it. Uh, this is your warning, sir. Uh, if you're going to proceed in this manner, you will be removed from the court. In what manner? Be specific. What the hell is he talking about? He also had some choice words for the jury before they gave their verdict. I fear you'll take the easy way out, the safe way out. But if you do, your conscience will torment you the rest of your life. Judge, I'm going to object. That's you will live with your right. shame. God, I just, I've only got a half a paragraph left. Can I proceed? You will dread looking your children and grandchildren in their eyes. Judge, objection again. That is a failed threat. Unsurprisingly, they found Cross guilty of capital murder, but he remained defiant. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of capital murder as charged in count one. That, that lady just say. Ultimately, Cross was sentenced to death by lethal injection. To carry out the sentence of death by lethal injection as provided by Kansas law. However, one day my spirit will rise from my grave and you all know that I will rise. He later died in 2021 while on death row at the age of 80. While Fraser Cross's anti-Semitic rants were truly shocking, how does it compare to running over a black teenager in a hate-filled crime? Like in the case of Russell Courtier, who's on trial for a hit-and-run incident in Oregon. As per reports, Courtier got in a fight with 19-year-old Larnell Bruce outside a 7-Eleven in Portland. After his head was smashed into a glass window, Bruce attempted to flee but an enraged courtier followed Bruce in a red Jeep, allegedly being egged on by his girlfriend, Colleen Hunt, to run the black teen over. CCTV footage caught courtier missing Bruce by a whisker in his first attempt. But as soon as Bruce crossed the road, Courtier accelerated straight towards him. And hit him as he tried to escape towards the sidewalk. Bruce was severely injured. He died a few days later at the hospital. Both Courtier and his girlfriend Colleen were charged with murder. Shortly after the trial began, Colleen pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of manslaughter and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Prosecutors argued that race was a motivating factor in the attack since Courtier was previously a member of the white supremacist group European Kindred. It was a racially motivated crime because it was for European Kindred. It was a racially motivated murder. They also said that this was a cold-blooded murder. When he chased Mr. Bruce with that red Jeep, he had one intent, and that was to kill Mr. Bruce. The jury, too, saw it that way, eventually convicting Courtier of hit-and-run driving and murder. We, the jury, find the defendant as to the murder guilty. He was additionally found guilty of the hate crime of second-degree intimidation. We, the jury, find the defendant as to count three intimidation and in second-degree guilty. At his sentencing, Bruce's father addressed his son's killer. You didn't just ruin my life, but you ruined your own. You have a son, and now he has to live the rest of his life without his father. And hopefully he doesn't make and think the same way that you do. This world, is, is, it doesn't belong to any of us. We're just here visiting, and everyone has a right to be here. Ultimately, Courtier was sentenced to life in prison, with a minimum of 28 years served before being eligible for parole. While Russell Courtier will spend a significant part of his life in prison for his rage-fueled racial attack, 
How does it compare to threatening a kid with racial slurs? Like the case of Michael Amatullo, who's facing hate crime charges in Oregon. As per reports, 60-year-old Amatullo allegedly hurled racial slurs at a 7-year-old African-American child in their apartment complex in Portland. When the child's 14-year-old brother came to his defense, Amatullo racially abused him too. The boy's 14-year-old brother came out to defend him, at which point Amatullo allegedly threatened to beat them. Then he went inside his kitchen and brought a butcher knife, allegedly threatening the kids with it. He then went back inside and returned with a butcher knife, according to reports. The police say Amatullo pointed the knife at the boys from about six or seven feet away. This prompted them to run and hide under a nearby stairwell, where the teen called the authorities. Amatullo was arrested and charged with misdemeanor menacing, second-degree intimidation, and unlawful use of a weapon. In court, the innocent seven-year-old child testified that Amatullo's threats about killing his mother had saddened him. Then it was Judge Christopher Ramra's turn to school Amatulo. When he spoke today, he didn't say anything about the N-word. He just talked about sort of how things made him feel sad because he's a child. He doesn't process things in the same way that we do. That sort of leads to the credibility of what he had to say. And the normal reaction, if a seven-year-old is looking at an adult, is to smile at them, is to maybe talk to them. It's not to say, what the F are you looking at? And then to call them the N-word. When you're talking about someone, it never came out of trial, but I'm assuming he was in first grade, maybe kindergarten. He said the incident could leave a lasting impression on the two children. I have to imagine that most African Americans can remember the first time that somebody used the N-word in anger against them. They may not even you know, depend on their age, might not have fully understood its significance at that point in time, but as they grow older and have more experiences, I, I have to think that's something that resonates. Ultimately, Amatullo was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to three years in prison. Portland man was sentenced to three years for a bias crime against two black brothers. He will spend two years in prison and one in jail. While Michael Amatullo paid a heavy price for his racist demeanor, what happens when you kill someone for going against your beliefs? Like in the case of Devin Arthurs, who's facing murder charges in Florida. 18-year-old Arthurs, along with his four roommates, were part of a neo-Nazi group called the Adamwaffen Division. However, things changed drastically when Arthurs converted to Islam, a stark departure from his neo-Nazi roots. His newfound faith created tension within the group, who often teased him for his new beliefs. When things reached a boiling point on May 19, 2017, Arthurs fatally shot two of his roommates, 22-year-old Jeremy Himmelman and 18-year-old Andrew Onischuk at their apartment in Tampa. He claims he shot two of his roommates because they ridiculed him for converting to Islam. When police arrived at the scene, they discovered a chilling cache of evidence. They found explosive materials, weapons, and other bomb-making substances. Arthurs was arrested and interrogated, where he told police about the sinister plans of his roommates. Yeah, nothing's been constructed yet, but this is clearly stuff that, that is lined up for the explosives there. That's the purpose of those items? Yeah. So, we, so that's, that's, the, that's the entire purpose of it. You guys don't build model rockets and uh, go out in the back and no. shoot them off into the, you know, or, no. or fireworks for 4th of July coming no. out. There's not, nothing no, like that. none of that. It's all literally there specifically to kill people. Arthur said he acted out of a belief that his roommates' planned bombings would lead to the Fourth Reich. What, what was their purpose for doing that? Oh, what would it be? Because they wanted, they wanted to go to the Fourth Reich, they're delusional. Oh, okay. He also spoke about his mental health issues. I'm very prone to getting angry a lot. I'm very to the point where I think that I might be kind of sick in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to get help for that. It seems Arthur's mental health worsened in prison because what he did in his court appearance shocked everyone, as they saw Arthur seemingly choking himself to the point of unconsciousness. Devin Arthur's appearance in court was anything but ordinary. Everyone in the courtroom, including the judge, got a first-hand look at Arthur's appearing to choke himself to the point of unconsciousness. 
It's the type of involuntary reflex. A doctor who evaluated Arthur's took the stand to explain his odd behavior. He squeezes and lets his head fall into his hands to compress his blood vessels until he begins to lose consciousness. The case seemed to be heading towards a mistrial. However, on May 8th, 2023, Arthur surprised everyone by accepting a plea deal. How do you wish to plead to these five charges? I plead guilty. Arthur said he was a changed man and wanted to help the world fight extremism. I feel that I can be an advocate against extremism and I'd like to take this moment to tell the world to stay away from extremist groups and tell that I want to try to dedicate my life to getting people away from militant movements and stuff like that. Ultimately, Arthur's was convicted of two reduced charges of second-degree murder and sentenced to 45 years in prison. I will adjudicate him guilty. I will sentence him to 45 years in Florida State Prison with a 25-year minimum mandatory on counts one and two. While Devin Arthur's bizarre case ended with him getting a hefty prison sentence, how does it compare to targeting and murdering a couple? Like in the case of neo-Nazi couple Jeremy Moody and his wife Christine Moody, who are facing murder charges in South Carolina. I have no regrets. Killing that pedophile was the best day of my life. Do you have anything to say to the victim's family? May they die also. Reports suggest the Moody's targeted and killed registered sex offender Marvin Parker and his wife Gretchen Parker after getting their address from the registry. CCTV footage showed the Moody's kidnapping the Parkers at gunpoint, where they later shot and stabbed them. Police were able to identify Jeremy from his white supremacist tattoos in the footage. When questioned, the killer couple didn't deny their guilt. In fact, they not only confessed, but also told authorities they had planned to kill more sex offenders. The Moody's pleaded guilty to murder, kidnapping, and burglary, and appeared in court all smiles, ready to ask the judge for mercy, as well as the minimum sentence of 30 years in prison. Then it was Christine's chance to plead for forgiveness. The Bible clearly states that I shall not kill. I'm sorry I broke that commandment, but I truly believe God has forgiven Jeremy and I. I hope she will too. Your Honor, please see it fit that Jeremy and I are sentenced to the same sentence of 30 years. Never kissing my husband or feeling his touch again is my very worst nightmare. Please give us the light at the end of the tunnel. While the Moody's initially were remorseful for their actions, they showed their true colors once the judge handed down the sentence. This is how they responded. Outside the courtroom, the Moody's continued to express their true feelings. Child molesters do not deserve to live. They got exactly what they deserve. I had to do it over again. I'd kill more. I think Jeremy and I would have done it again if given the opportunity. Do you have any regrets? I have no regrets. Killing that pedophile was the best day of my life. Do you have anything to say to the victim's family? May they die also. Ultimately, they received consecutive life sentences with no chance of parole. While Jeremy and Christine Moody's remorseless killings shocked the community, how does it compare to terrorizing a whole nation? Like in the case of Anders Breivik, who's on trial for mass murder and terrorism in Norway. On July 22, 2011, 32-year-old Breivik parked a white van full of explosives outside the Prime Minister's office in Oslo. He was then seen walking away from the area, dressed in a police uniform. What followed next rocked the entire nation of Norway. 
A huge explosion ripped through the area, damaging buildings and businesses nearby. The blast left a scene of utter chaos, with death and destruction everywhere. 3.26 p.m., a massive car bomb shatters downtown Oslo. The target, the Prime Minister's office. The streets turn into makeshift triage areas, but this horror is only beginning. Eight people died in the explosion, while another 209 were injured. But this was only a small part of Brevik's sinister plans. While the authorities were confused and distracted by the blast, Brevik drove out of town all the way to the island of Utoya, where a youth summer camp was being organized. Brevik uh, was driving out of town when, the, uh, when his bomb exploded. There, dressed as a police officer with a false ID, Brevik opened fire, methodically killing 69 and injuring more than 30 people. There was chaos all over the island, with people seen swimming into the freezing water, trying to escape the rampage. The horror lasted for more than an hour before Brevik made a chilling call to the authorities. Brevik said his mission was complete and offered to surrender. Delta Police Task Force soon surrounded the island and arrested an eerily calm and composed Brevik. In total, 77 people lost their lives that day, while hundreds were injured, making it the deadliest attack in Norway since World War II. A few days before the shooting, Brevik had posted online a 1,500-page manifesto with chilling details and meticulous plans for his attacks. Brevik was charged with mass murder, causing a fatal explosion and terrorism. Before his trial began, Brevik was taken back to Utoya, shackled and tethered to reenact the shootings. At his trial, Brevik, who was publicly against multiculturalism, refused to recognize the authority of the court and the judge. Han befant sig i andra etage i R4 på ett kontor mot Grubbegata och blev påfört bland annat allvarliga hodeskador med blödning mellan hjärnan och den yttre hjärnhinnan, stora skador i buken med omfattande indre blödning som brud i nacken. Brevik pleaded not guilty and bizarrely claimed that his actions were taken in self-defense. Jag känner handlingarna men inte straffskyl och jag påberopar mig nödrätt. The main focus of the trial was to determine Brevik's criminal responsibility and whether he would be sentenced to prison or committed to psychiatric care. Ultimately, Brevik was found sane and sentenced to 21 years of preventive detention, which is the maximum sentence allowed under Norwegian law, with the possibility of extension if he's still considered a danger to society. This is a unanimous judgment and it has the following conclusion. All seen in conjunction with Section 62 of the Penal Code to preventive detention pursuant to the Penal Code Section 39C number 1 for a term of 21 years and a minimum period of 10 years. Brevik has since been denied parole.